V1. Pull up. Pull up. Pull up. Terrain. Terrain. Pull up. Terrain. Welcome to the Flight Safety Detectives. Hosts John Golia and Greg Fife, two of the world's most respected aviation safety experts, talk all things related to aviation and aerospace. This podcast and the Flight Safety Detectives YouTube channel are brought to you by the Professional Aviation Maintenance Association, PAMA, and Avemco Insurance, a world-class provider of aviation insurance and your one stop for all general aviation insurance needs. Get a customized quote at avemco.com or give them a call at 888-879-0389. Tell them you're a listener of the show and receive a 5% discount. Now it's time to buckle up because it's wheels up for the latest episode of Flight Safety Detectives. Well, hello, gentlemen. It is another episode of Flight Safety Detectives. It's always good to see you, Todd Curtis and John Golia, my flight safety detective partners. I hope that uh, all has been well with both of you. We've all been traveling, and uh, so, of course, we'll talk about that later on. But uh, I think we've got a pretty interesting show today. One, because we just had a recent helicopter accident that made quite a bit of news both on TV and, of course, on the internet because of some dramatic video. And then we have an accident that we are going to discuss in the Whiskey Tango Foxtrot file. So uh, before we get to that accident, uh, let's, uh, let's chat a little bit about this helicopter accident and what that video showed and all the storylines now that have been built around the fact that uh, this was an R-44 on a training flight down in Rolette, Texas, and uh, beautiful blue sky, sunny day. Um, somebody captured uh, the video or captured a camera um, on their phone and captured some video of the uh, aircraft as it was descending. It, uh, it was coming down in multiple parts because the tail rotor had been uh, separated from the rest of the aircraft. Later determined, I think, that it was pretty obvious that most likely the, uh, the tail boom was cut by the main rotor blade. And um, that brings up a lot of questions with regard to pilot training. Of course, uh, training as far as a flight instructor's experience and knowledge. Um, we've had a number of helicopters that have crashed over uh, the recent uh, past. In fact, uh, over the last year, there's been a lot of different helicopter accidents, flight training. And the question, of course, amongst many others is, what's going on? Is it because we're trying to rush pilots through because of this, quote, pilot shortage across the board? Or is this just uh, inexperience? Or, um, you know, are, are pilots finding themselves, especially flight instructors, finding themselves in a position with a student where they're letting things go a little too far before they try to intervene and take the appropriate corrective action. And, and I was wondering, John, you know, you watch this video, what, uh, what are your thoughts? It's a Robinson. So of course the internet blows up with uh, all the bad stuff about uh, the Robinson helicopters. Well, Robinson does have a, a, have a, an accident rate that makes you give it a second look for sure. Uh, but that's because it's used a lot in pilot training. So pilots learning to fly a helicopter make mistakes. And a Robinson is maybe not the most forgiving training helicopter there is out there, especially the R-22. Yeah. The numbers for the R-44 have been better than the R-22. But uh, I guess I, before I blame it all on the helicopter, I, I got to blame it on the... Uh, novice pilot trying to learn and the instructors that like you said may be waiting a second or two too long to take it over and uh, and then when they do it's too late yeah one of the other issues and todd you can speak to this because uh, you're back flying again with an instructor and that is um again you have uh you know whether you're demonstrating as a flight instructor I have to demonstrate to the student, okay, this is how you properly do a, a, a maneuver. And you're gonna demonstrate the technique and, and the cues to look for, whether they're in the helicopter, outside the helicopter. 
Um, that's one part of it. But then, of course, you're turning it over to uh, a student, possibly, to then perform that maneuver. And you're watching technique, and you expect that there's going to be some slop in those, in you know, in the student pilot's maneuvering of the aircraft. But how far, as an instructor, do I let that go? And it's really very subjective. Some are are, are very cautious, and they'll get right on it and intervene. Others will just go, ah, just fix that, or try to coach the student through it. And then next thing you know, they're finding themselves in a position they don't want to be in. What do you see in, when, when you're flying with your instructor? Well, as a, uh, as a student of flying again, where I first started flying basically in the 1970s, I already had a private certificate from years back, but I'm relearning a lot of things, especially the physicality of flying an aircraft and like riding a bicycle. Well, once you learn it, you never forget it. Not so much with, with airplanes. There's a whole lot of that sort of muscle memory that has to come back. It comes back slowly. And speaking personally, my reactions to situations are getting more predictable as I get more experience doing basic maneuvers and such. As an instructor, you have the difficult task of seeing inside of someone's mind and anticipating what they're going to do. And if it's something that you haven't done yourself or grew out of or are no longer familiar with being in that phase of flying, I can see where things can go a second or two too long. And a second or two could be the difference between a stable flight and a boring trip home and something altogether different. Yeah. And, and uh, I, I can't uh, you know, point to this situation. Well, the instructor did something wrong. Yeah. It's a dynamic situation. Yeah. Especially when you're flying a helicopter. It's also dynamic. Yeah. Especially when you're flying a helicopter because it is very dynamic. And in, in the maneuvers that you're demonstrating to a student in a helicopter are so much different. Uh, you know, just for an example, when you're doing auto rotations in a helicopter, there's technique, there are numbers that you have to follow in order for that helicopter to perform the way you want it to perform because you got to keep that rotor RPM up or you're coming out of the sky like a brick break. Mm -hmm. Now, let me wave the hat. Now that we have a break, let me share the screen. Let me see if I can run the video and actually have it be nice and stable on the screen. We can talk about the video later. If it does, if it turns out that it's unstable, I'll just get screen grabs from it and we can talk about the video. So if you allow me to share the screen, we'll run the thing on live a few times. Go for it. Okay. Ooh, all right. Where the heck is it? Here we go. Share. Okay. Now, it's only like 12 seconds long. I'm going to run it a couple of times, but yeah, here you is get, a video taken by some I know, but Hold on. You got to get rid of that banner across the bottom. There we go. And you'll see in this video, you have two white dots on either side of that vertical uh, electrical wire. The one on the right is a helicopter. One on the left is one of the pieces of the head of helicopter. I'm Apparently the, the tail roller section. I'm podcast to call you back. I don't know, 30 minutes. Okay. Um, okay, let's let's go back on and I'll introduce the fact that you know where I where I left off was I wanted to talk about performing auto rotations okay. and demonstration of settling with power and other maneuvers. Let and me stop the sheriff so you can do that. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, but you know, okay. Five, four, three, two. One of the things that, of course, we're talking about when we're looking at uh, performing maneuvers, especially in a helicopter, are the demonstrations of things like auto rotations, which simulates an engine out, and now you have to ro auto rotate to the ground. And of course, if you don't keep that rotor RPM up, your lifeline is gone because that rotor system are your wings. And, uh, and if you get that rotor system too slow, you're coming out of the sky like a brick. Unlike with an airplane, you lose the engine. And as long as you keep your proper glide speed up, you're going to be able to glide. And of course, you can stall a wing just like you can stall the rotor system. You also demonstrate other maneuvers in the helicopter, such as settling with power, things like that, where or even a, a ring state where you're actually getting into your own rotor wash and of course the blades lose lift 
And those are some of the possibilities that, you know, maybe they were demonstrating one or more of these types of type of maneuvers and, uh, and they got themselves into a situation that regardless of the altitude they were at, they couldn't get the aircraft back flying again. And I think Todd, uh, you know, some of the video uh, shows, um, you know, the fact that uh, the aircraft had come apart, but now the question is, why did it come apart? Did the tail rotor separate from, uh, from the rest of the uh, main body of the aircraft because it was cut by the, uh, the main rotor? Or was there a problem with the tail rotor itself? And of course, investigators are gonna have to, to look at that to see if there was any evidence of a mechanical malfunction or failure. And this event happened about four days before we we're doing the show. So there are at least two pieces of video that are out there already. There might be others, but we'll start with uh, one that was uh, fairly popular, getting a whole lot of play on the internet. And I can't find out where it went. Okay, come on now, where is it? Desktop one? No. Well, we'll, we'll put the link up. I know that- ah, There we go. Can you see it now? No. That's okay. I mean, we'll put the link up on, uh, on our website so that people can actually go to it and look at it. But um, one of the curious things about uh, you know, this particular accident and Robinson helicopters is some of the warnings that um, are out there in the, uh, not only the flight manual, but um, safety notices that, uh, that are published on behalf of Robinson. And, and the one that caught my attention that I know that uh, you both have looked at talks about when the uh, main rotor stalls. And I just wanted to read something because it gets your attention. And if you're a pilot flying a Robinson helicopter and you read this safety notice, it could take you back a little bit and give you a pause because it starts out when the rotor stalls, it does not do so symmetrically because any forward airspeed of the helicopter will produce a higher airflow on the advancing blade than on the retreating blade. That's basic helicopter aerodynamics. This causes the retreating blade to stall first, allowing it to dive as it goes aft, while the advancing blade is still climbing as it goes forward. The resulting low aft blade and high forward blade become a rapid aft tilt, aft tilt of the main rotor disc sometimes referred to as rotor blowback. Also, as the helicopter begins to fall, the upward flow of air underneath the tail surface tends to pitch the aircraft nose down. These two effects combined with aft cyclic by the pilot attempting to keep the nose from dropping will frequently allow the rotor blades to blow back and chop off the tail boom as the stalled helicopter falls. Due to the magnitude of the forces involved in the flexibility of the rotor blades, rotor teeter stops will not prevent the boom chop. The resulting boom chop, and here's the, the critical statement, the resulting boom chop, however, is academic as the aircraft and its occupants are already doomed by the stalled rotor before the chop occurs. That's a pretty serious pointed statement that you get yourself into this situation you are now along for the ride you there's just nothing you can do and that i'll tell you is a real attention grabber it and sure. it didn't necessarily happen in this case because again the investigation is as early as stages but it certainly sounds similar to what you would see if you saw the video uh, there's an interesting aside throughout all of this now, the last couple of years, we've had substantial increases in the helicopter fleet. And the, the, the 2021 production for piston-powered helicopters was up 27%. And turbine helicopters was up 25%. So for whatever reason, we've got an awful lot of helicopters coming into, this, into the field. So the pilot training for helicopter pilots has got to be ramped up considerably. And I wonder if all these pilots, the instructor pilots, are uh, trying to get as many people through as they can. They themselves are experiencing fatigue and uh, overload from having to deal with inexperienced pilots. I mean, there may be a lot more at play here than just uh, a dumb pilot in this particular airport. Yeah, and you bring up a good point, John, because um, I got a friend of mine that owns a uh, helicopter flight school. 
He also has a 135 certificate. He does, uh, he does air tours and that kind of stuff. He is having a difficult time hiring flight instructors and the flight, and he has high standards. So of course, trying to hire a high time flight instructor is, is, is just damn near impossible for him. So now he's having to vet some of these lower time pilots. He still maintains his minimum that unless you have 300 hours of, of experience in running tours and, and flight time and a particular helicopter, you're not flying in these tours. So he has got some standards, but the problem is the pilots that he's trying to find to fill those standards are almost non-existent. So you start looking at the, the flight instructor fleet for, uh, for helicopters and you don't have the highest time flight instructors out there. So it, 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 it's a quandary. Yeah, these pilots need to build time. They need to become more experienced flight instructors. How do they do that? They gotta fly. Well, I understand all of that, but it's not like there's a big pool to draw from. And now you have relatively inexperienced as far as practical experience in the helicopter as a flight instructor teaching an inexperienced student. So, I mean, are these the kinds of things that are, are causing or at least contributing to accidents? And I think that the NTSB and the FAA need to be looking at that, as well as the rest of the industry. I mean, again, I sit on the, uh, the board of the National Association of Flight Instructors, and that's a big issue, is what are the common denominators that we can find from some of these accidents, try to identify solutions and get them back into the industry. So, and your particular operator you mentioned is not dealing with people with minimum standards. That said, in spite of the commercial pressure to have more of this activity, the minimum standards aren't going to change. The FAA is not easing back on the standards to increase the number of pilots, number of instructors. So, that's going to be a, a part of the system where, in spite of the demand, there's going to be a limited supply. Yeah, I mean, they're qualified. The, the FAA's deemed them qualified to hold the certificate as, a, as an instructor, and I, I'm not challenging that. It's just a practical experience, and we've seen that when, when you have, um, you know, relatively inexperienced people teach another inexperienced people, and, um, and of course, the outcomes of, of all of that. But now I want to switch gears to, uh, to our primary accident, and we bring this accident to you from the Whiskey Tango Foxtrot Files, um, because it is a classic as far as going into uh, some of the more ridiculous aspects. And in this business, John, you and me, we've all seen accidents where you just shake your head because there is no logic there is no lessons learned. Well, there, there are in this one, but, and we'll bring those out because I think they're more funny lessons than anything else. But we, we've had a tragic loss of life because of careless, reckless, overconfident, a whole bunch of different uh, behavioral issues with this pilot. And, um, and just to get into it quickly, and uh, again, we'll post some information on our website so that you can actually get into the NTSB's report and, and read their entire report. But I'm going to give you a synoptic. This is an accident that occurred involving a uh, Piper PA-22, a tri-pacer. And um, it happened in Kingman, Arizona back in 2019. And it was, uh, it was a one fatal, one serious accident. The pilot, uh, male, um, survived the accident with serious injuries. The female passenger, who was uh, technically his, um, his partner, girlfriend, if you will, uh, she uh, perished in the accident. But it was a, an accident that involved these two folks that had flown to a birthday party in, uh, in Arizona. They had made a trip from um, Mead, Arizona, or going to meet Arizona for a birthday party. They arrived late in the afternoon. Apparently they enjoyed themselves at this birthday party and uh, pretty much got lit up until uh, two o'clock in the morning. And then we're flying back to, uh, to Kingman um, the next day. And, um, and so, <laughs> they show up at the airport and of course it's only you know six hours seven hours later after uh, they have been drinking according to witnesses pretty heavily and um, they got out to the airplane and the 
female passenger apparently contacted her sister and said, Hey, we're going to fly to another airport. We got to get gas. And, um, the, uh, the airplane, unfortunately never made it to that other airport, but it was an interesting side note that the airplane, when it did crash only made it about 10 or 12 miles from the takeoff point. And so, you know, it sounds like, okay, you get maybe a, a fuel exhaustion problem, fuel starvation problem. Uh, the pilot tried to put it down, unfortunately put it down in a ravine, uh, significantly damaged the airplane. He was seriously injured. She was fatally injured. And according to witnesses, the pilot had told them, um, cause he ended up crawling out of the wreckage, getting to a road and, uh, flagging down some passerby people in a car that uh, he had an electrical failure, was trying to turn around, uh, lost engine power at the same time, ended up uh, losing the airplane and, and crashing. It's, it's all of the findings, though, gentlemen, that really make this story. We know that pilots take off. We know they have engine problems. We know they try to make the, the proverbial 180 degree turn to go back to the airport, things like that. And, and, you know, you can piece together what uh, circumstances uh, occurred and, and the fact that the pilot may not have operated the airplane properly, hit the best glide speed, flew it into the ground, blah. And it, those are the, the basic, you know, typical facts. But in this particular instance, you start dissecting and we start with the pilot and we start with the airplane and then we start with the circumstances uh, it becomes a very, very interesting story. The, uh, the girlfriend apparently um, recently purchased this airplane for her boyfriend, basically, or at least for her boyfriend to use the airplane. Um, she was not a pilot. She had no student pilot certificate or anything else, but she had purchased the airplane a couple of months before after having sold a house so maybe she was trying to put money somewhere and she bought this airplane. Uh, the problem is, is that the registration had expired and the FAA sent her a notice saying, hey, your airplane, you can't fly your airplane because uh, your registration has expired. And apparently they never uh, renewed the, uh, the registration. So now all of a sudden you have one strike against you for an unairworthy airplane because the registration isn't, isn't valid. The other thing is when she bought this airplane, um, she's not a pilot, so she couldn't get insurance on the airplane. And, um, and so now you have an uninsured, unregistered airplane. The topper, of course, is her pilot boyfriend isn't really a pilot, if you will. He held a student pilot certificate, supposedly, um, that had been issued five years before the accident. And when he got that, and that was the days when, um, when it was a combined student pilot certificate and a medical certificate, he declared on his form when he went in for his medical examination that he was fit as a fiddle, had no pre existing conditions and that kind of stuff. But the accident um, and the follow up to some of his medical records, and of course, the injuries that he suffered and the, the records that they got from uh, the hospital tell a different story. Todd, I know that you always like to delve into medical stuff and we are always cautious because we're not doctors and we're not, gonna, we're not gonna dissect this guy. But one of the findings that the NTSB made and which was documented in some of the reports, including the NTSB report and statement and witness statements was the fact that this pilot had diabetes and was using an insulin pump. And in fact, when uh, he was being transported to the hospital after the accident, had had several seizures apparently attributed to his diabetes. And the question of course is, what were the triggers for that? And then did that alcohol, uh, at least the, the heavily <laughs> heavy drinking, did that contributor cause it? We don't know, we're not doctors, but all of a sudden now you have a pre-existing medical condition that you haven't disclosed on an FAA medical. And even if he doesn't disclose this to an FAA official or a medical official, 
it's a common sense sort of thing. Now, I don't have diabetes, but I have other chronic health issues. Of course, you get to a certain age, you have chronic health issues of various types, most of which have nothing to do with whether you can fly a plane or not, some of which do. Diabetes is one of these where even if it's not causing a problem now, it should be something you should pay attention to. And just uh, normal daily activities with diabetes, if you're not taking care of your insulin, what effect does it have on you as an individual? Individuals yeah. vary. And, and in the and, hospital, you had a very high uh, rate, a very high level of uh, blood sugar. Was this due to the fact he wasn't taking his medicine after the accident? Was he high before the accident, high blood sugar before the accident? Was he not taking the right meds? These questions come up. They yeah. weren't answered by the public docket, but these are common sense questions you would have if you have a chronic medical condition. And you have to ask yourself, you know, did he have a problem in the air? And he was using, you know, the mechanical issues with the airplane as an excuse. That too is uh, has been unanswered because apparently after the accident, the NTSB's investigation, uh, this pilot hasn't been very cooperative, <laughs> hasn't provided him with any information, and basically has disappeared. So when when you look at these kinds of things, you know, there's going to be a lot of unanswered questions. But John, when we look at the the wreckage itself. One of the findings that was made was the fact that there were no fuel caps on either fuel tank. <laughs> and, oh. and, and how many times do you preach pre-flight, pre-flight, yes. pre-flight, pre-flight? So the question is, where did those caps go? And where did the fuel go? Exactly. And went away. Yeah. And so here you now have a pilot, they, you know, they go out to the airport after their little binge from the night before, was he, was he looking to put fuel in the aircraft, took the fuel caps off and then said, uh oh, we can't get fuel here, we have to go somewhere else, and forgot to put the caps on for whatever reason. And uh, of course, uh, the airplane didn't make it that far from the airport. So the NTSB has said that there, there was no evidence of fuel at the accident site. The first responders said that they, had, uh, they saw no evidence or smelled no evidence of fuel. So one can probably conclude logically that uh, this was a fuel exhaustion case. Now the question like you just brought up is, did they fly into Mead after having come from somewhere else and forgot to put the fuel caps on and they siphoned all that gas. They didn't have a lot when they landed. And of course, it's obvious that he probably didn't do a pre-flight. And if he did, he must have missed something. Um, well, let me make, make, make sure I'm clear here. You're implying that it's possible the fuel caps were not left off right before the last flight, but before the next, the last flight. Yeah. I mean, where were they? Um, the NTSB doesn't say anything about anybody finding fuel caps at the airport. Um, they just made the uh, factual finding that there weren't any fuel caps on the airplane when they examined the wreckage. Now, and this accident as a whole is a perfect example of why I encourage people not just to look at the NTSB accident report, but at the public docket, because yep. sometimes there are some really eye-opening things that bring up questions. Now, I'm going to get away from the Peyton Place Lifetime movie aspects of the public docket. <laughs> but one thing we were discussing before the show is this is a person who had the money to buy an airplane on behalf of another person, and they were being flown around by this other person. And this might be something casually done with cars and boats, but the rules are different. You really can't do that with an airplane. And, and Greg, you can probably shed, and, and you too, John, shed some specific light on what does the FAA consider to be a commercial operation? Well, when you look at one, I mean, this airplane was uninsured and, um, and it's, a, it's a evident that because the, uh, the woman who owned the aircraft technically um, wasn't a pilot and there's no way she was going to name, I mean, she could have tried to name her boyfriend as a pilot on the, uh, on the insurance policy, but according to his last medical certificate, he had a total flight time, total flight time, total flight time of two hours. And that was five years before. Now, the NTSB did write about the fact that a, uh, the woman who uh, was killed in the accident, her mother apparently had ridden with this pilot and her daughter 
in this airplane on several occasions. And let me just read you something that is, uh, of course, quite entertaining, like all the other aspects of this particular uh, accident. And that was that she had stated that when she was flying in this airplane, she actually was in the back seat of the aircraft and, um, and the seat that was in the back of the airplane was as she described it to be a lawn chair type seat. Now, the back of a tripacer isn't that big, but for it to be a quote lawn chair type seat is quite interesting to say the least. But she wrote, <laughs> in, or she provided in a statement, videos that, sh that she's shot when she was riding in the back seat, videos provided by this woman taken while riding as a passenger in the back seat does indeed show the aircraft flying between two canyon walls, approximately 200 feet from the tops and approximately 50 feet above the water. This woman stated, there was a lawn chair type arrangement fitted in the back seat that was held in place by cargo straps. And that, and that was used for the seat that she was riding in. Now, again, what the hell were you thinking? I mean, there is no way, no way that I would ever get into an airplane with a lawn chair that's being held down by a cargo strap or anything like that and, and, and assume that that's normal or good to go or acceptable or prudent or lot or any of the other terms you want to use. Who does that? Apparently enough people to make it normal. I mean, how many, we see too many of these. I mean, this one is really egregious, but we see accidents all too regularly with pilots that disregard common sense to go to go have fun or go do whatever it is they want to do. And, you know, it'll be all right this one time. It'll be all right. I, we can get away with this. That is a good word to, to good phrase, common sense. If you are in a position where you're, invited to fly with someone or would like to fly with someone, and you see something that doesn't make any sense. If you see a setup in an airplane, it looks like something out of a Homer Simpson's cartoon. <laughs> walk away, right? I'm not saying report them to the, to the federal authorities, but if you don't feel comfortable doing something in an airplane with someone because of the way they're behaving, the way the airplane looks, because you're not an expert, but you see a bunch of screws loose, either with the airplane or the pilot, you should say to yourself, no, I'm not going here. Well, the other thing is, is that this, uh, this person who had ridden in the back seat also said that the airplane was equipped with shoulder harnesses, yet anytime she observed um, anybody in the aircraft, they never used the shoulder harnesses. It's like, oh my God, come on, really? I mean, you have safety devices in there. Could that have changed the outcome Apparently, you know, he did, the, the pilot did survive with serious injuries. I mean, could she have survived if they had been wearing shoulder harnesses? Who knows? Why would you disregard a safety device that could save your life? And in this case, you know, that could have changed the outcome. But I mean, when you look at the, the ridiculousness um, you know, and, and then the NTSB was very short in their probable cause statement, which I found kind of interesting as well. John and I both know the, uh, the investigator in charge. And again, we, we talk about this all the time with obvious probable cause. That is, you know, when we're critical of, of the NTSB um, and, and the fact that they come up with these one-line probable cause statements, it's like you didn't even need to leave the office to figure that out. And this is one of those probable cause statements where it says, the student pilot's failure to secure the fuel caps, which led to the fuel being siphoned overboard, fuel exhaustion, and the total loss of engine power. Really? I mean, tell me something I don't know. 
but they don't tell you where those fuel caps were. They don't tell you where this sequence of events started. And oh, by the way, the question I asked a little earlier of John was, what about the pre-flight? What about the pre-flight? What about the pre-flight? And pre-flight planning, pre-flight inspection of the aircraft. And of course, then you can get really into, first off, this guy wasn't a pilot. He's flying illegally. He's falsified a medical. He's flying passengers technically under a student pilot certificate, which, oh, by the way, is expired. And then on top of that, they don't have insurance. Who knows if he actually knew? I mean, it's obvious he could fly the airplane because he yanked and banked it on several occasions with other people on the airplane. And then, of course, you know, in this particular instance, um, they don't dissect or if they did dissect, they didn't do a very good job. Was this a stall spin type accident? Did the guy fly it into the ground because he was at a low altitude, went to best glide speed, had no place else to put it except in a ravine? All of these questions are things that I, as an investigator, would want to answer in my investigation, not just, well, the obvious, the pilot forgot to secure the fuel caps. Really? Really? Come on. I mean, if you're going to benefit aviation safety and lessons learned, then let's get to the complete story, not the big red easy button. Well, you know, fuel caps are gone, fuel siphon. The guy just took off. He wasn't that far. He was only 10 miles from the airport. He couldn't have siphoned that much gas off. So the question is, do some aircraft performance. How much fuel did he get from the last place he stopped? And then do all the aircraft performance to see if that sequence of events started well before this last takeoff. There's another issue here, which is typically not discussed by the NTSB, but I think it's particularly relevant here. That's the social dynamic of you have one person who wants to fly and another person who wants to fly. They're coming from different worlds. One person has resources, the money. The other person has presumably the knowledge. So let's put ourselves or any other aviation person in the shoes of the pilot. Let's say you were fully certificated. Let's say you did have your medical up to date and you, someone makes you an offer that's hard to refuse. It's like, hey, I want you to fly me around this really, really sweet aircraft that you've been dreaming about for years. It's all up to date. Let's assume it has, has proper insurance. Let's assume everything is okay on the surface. What is your responsibility as a pilot to evaluate a situation like this where someone's offering you an opportunity to go fly? Well, that's a pretty dynamic and fluid situation. One, if I own the airplane, but I don't have a pilot certificate and I come to you, Todd, and say, hey, I got this airplane, you got a pilot certificate, fly me around. I would think that the FAA could take exception to that because they may see that as a for hire situation. And when you look at compensation or hire, the FAA looks at a variety of different things. It's not just money exchanging hands. It's what does the pilot benefit from the operation? I've done a number of accidents where um, I did a King Air that crashed out here in uh, Colorado. The airplane had been donated by an alumni to a basketball team. They flew uh, the coaches out here on the airplane. And in return, the pilots were given tickets to the game. They went to the game, watched the game, came back, got on the airplane. They were heading back and they had an in-flight problem, crashed the airplane, killed everybody. The question is, was that a commercial flight? That is a flight for hire or compensation. And the FAA looked at that and thought that those tickets were a form of compensation. And so that was a commercial operation. The same thing here is that you own the airplane I have a pilot certificate. You need to go fly from you know um, Boston down to Washington, D.C. I don't have any desire to go to Washington, D.C., but you call me and say, hey, will you fly me down there? I benefit from that flight in the accumulation of flight time. So it all depends on how the FAA looks at that operation, regardless of whether you're splitting expenses or not. Um, because compensation, the flight time could be a form of compensation that the FAA may say that's a commercial operation. And it's all up to the FAA and their interpretation of the rules. But the insurance company, if you're going to use me, then I technically have to meet any kind of pilot policy uh, 
provided by the insurance company. That is whatever the requisite requirements are to, uh, to reside on that insurance policy. So there are a lot of dynamics, a lot of moving pieces that if somebody's going to try and do this, you want to check with an insurance company in the FAA before you do it, just not to, so you don't get yourself in trouble. And John, you've Personally, been through this. You've, you've seen some of this that's come before the board on appeal. I'm sure when, um, when pilots have gotten whacked for um, you know, flying for compensation or higher, and they've pleaded their case that, well, I was splitting expenses, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, that, that's commonly, if they want to fight all the way, that's the, the excuse that they will use. But uh, those that get uh, decent attorney representation will mitigate the case out. They'll settle the case and not bring it up because they know it's going to it's going to do nothing but cost more money and they're going to lose. So yeah. they, usually, they usually don't get all the way up to the board unless you have, again, somebody with a lot of money that just says, I'm going to fight this all the way. Yeah. And, and they do when they lose. And, and we know that there is a proper way of doing things. If I own an airplane, I'm not a pilot. Um, and I'm going to go hire somebody that has a commercial certificate that can fly for hire. I am going to compensate them for flying my airplane. We see that. That's just a normal course of business. But where you really start skirting and, and getting yourself into trouble into that gray area as, is as a private owner, um, looking for your buddy neighbor next door who has a pilot's license to fly you around. Um, that's where things start to get real iffy. And, uh, and you want to be above board because the FAA doesn't take kindly now to what we call 134 and a half. That is these illegal charters or illegal flights for compensation or higher. And in fact, they have started an, a, a separate uh, office within the FAA for them to investigate these kinds of events solely. That is looking for these 134 and a half type operations um, because there are so many of them. And we in the industry have always talked about that a lot of these guys, guys being a generic term, a lot of these operators are getting away with things um, because they have the attitude of catch me if you can. And because the FAA is limited on resources and of course COVID really dented those resources and prevented a lot of the inspectors from traveling a lot of this really got ramped up. And as we've seen in this is industry since COVID, a lot of private aviation, that is charters, um, business aviation has ramped up uh, immensely because people want more control. They don't wanna have to go to the airport, wear a mask. They'd rather fly private charter business aviation to get around all of that. Yeah, business is booming for the real 135s hauling people around that don't want to put up with them, all yeah. the COVID problems. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting, as you were talking, I was thinking about uh, more than once I've been at airports, remote fields, and, you know, I'll go in there one day and it's booming GA. I mean, it's just GA all over the place, very busy. And I come back the next day and the airport's cleaned out. Mm. And, uh, and I saw that a couple of times and, and just, you know, shrug my shoulders but then i i started asking questions where did everybody go said the faa showed up this morning so everybody just <laughs> everybody took their airplane and left yep we hate <laughs> when those ramp checks happen yeah but get in, get out of dodge as quick as you can <laughs> yeah really well this is one of those accidents gentlemen that you just shake your head and I mean, it's tragic that there was a loss of life, but it's a laughable accident because of the circumstances and, and just the, you know, uh, well, the ridiculousness that does exist out there. And this isn't the only accident. I've investigated many accidents where you, 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 there's never going to be a lesson learned. It's never going to be an enhancement to aviation safety by dissecting these accidents. It's one of those that we, you know, you investigate, you file. And, you know, you put it in a book somewhere for coffee table humor. Um, but again, we lost a life in this. And um, it just demonstrates a very careless, reckless attitude, um, not only on the pilot's part for his own well-being, because he knew what his limitations were. He knew what his medical limitations um, were. And yet he chose to, you know, roll the dice, got himself into trouble 
and ended up uh, killing his significant other in this case. So um, these are these are events that, uh, you know, you just shake your head at. And that's why it is in our Whiskey Tango Foxtrot file, because it's just so sad. Um, these are the accidents that should have never happened. Well, I know that uh, we've we've run our course of uh, of time. Um, the three of us, I know I'm going to be traveling uh, coming up over the next several weeks. And I know you are too, John, you and I are going to be um, crossing paths here. Todd, we're going to have to get you out on the road so that uh, we can meet up and then maybe uh, try and do a real podcast live and in person between the three of us at some place. We'll, we'll find good it. to me. Yeah, we'll do it at a nice place. So well, well, we got one coming up at the end of April in Dallas, the three of yeah. us. Oh, yeah, that's true. We are because you're doing your uh, maintenance Olympics down there, John, and the three of us will be down there um, carrying on and, uh, of course, hooting and hollering for these teams. So um, we'll uh, we'll talk about that in our next show so that uh, we can let our listeners and viewers know about what this uh, maintenance Olympics is all about that uh, you now carry on your shoulders and you've been doing it for quite a long time and it's just a great event it's uh it's world renowned and of course it involves teams from all over the world um, not just uh domestically so it's an exciting thing for maintenance techs um in our in in the aviation world and i think that uh it'll be of interest to uh to our listeners and viewers so yeah. gentlemen today we got uh Todd, what was it? Egypt? There was two new teams from... Yeah, Egypt and what was it? Uh, oh, gosh, what was it? Brazil? Brazil. No, well, Brazil. good. Yeah, so we, it's, uh, it, we do cast a net far and wide. We've had uh, South Korea, China, Australia, Vietnam. Wow. I mean, it goes on and on. We've had teams from around the world. So, yes, we'll talk about that next week. But you know what? We left... We'd be remiss if we didn't say one thing about the, the woman who bought this airplane. If she had tried to insure the airplane, I know companies like Avemco would have been putting up great big red flags in front of her, yeah. which may have, may have caused her to pause and say, what am I getting into? Well, what do I need to do to correct this situation? Uh, and by not doing it, by not trying to insure the airplane, uh, she missed an opportunity to could have saved her own life. Yeah. And, and again, aviation, you know, you can't go into aviation with your head in the sand or a level of ignorance. You have to be well-educated before you jump in. And, and that's why, Hey, we got the internet, go do some research, really figure out what aircraft ownership is all about, what you're responsible for um, and things like that. Because again, you, you can't just go into it blindly because you're going to find yourself in a place you don't want to be. So, well, gentlemen, um, it's always good to, uh, to be on the air with both of you guys. Todd, I know that uh, you are always one to provide us some pearls of wisdom before I turn it over to John for the last word. Well, the lesson to take away from what we said today is the following. Uh, if you're interested in aviation safety, do look into that public docket. You'll be surprised at what you might find. Yeah. Yes. Entertaining reading. Yeah. Well, John, and we'll I, know, go I, I know where you're going to go. And this was a classic example of pre-flight yeah. preparation. So pre have at it. You know, doing pre-planning for your trip and then doing a good walk around on your airplane. And if you do it in a half hour lapses between when you did it, do it again to make sure that you haven't forgot something or somebody else hasn't come along and, and uh, done something to your airplane and forgot to put it back in an airworthy condition. I mean, this is a perfect example of flying with your fuel caps off. Here goes all your fuel load. You don't even see it. And all of a sudden, the engine's not working. So yeah. good pre-flight, good pre-planning and touch your airplane when you do it. I know Todd and I have been saying this and I know that uh, he's been laughing at me because I say it and he does it. <laughs> right. walk around that airplane and touch it touch it and uh, you'll be surprised what you can see what you learn what you remember so and with that if you do go flying please fly safely put your head on a swivel run it around we've had a few accidents with airplanes colliding with each other or things 
So you got to keep the the head moving, the eyes looking. And uh, we don't want to lose listeners. So no. please do a decent job. Save yeah. yourself, save your family the pain and suffering. Yeah, definitely please. subscribe because you're going to learn a lot. Please fly safely. To listen or watch more episodes of this show, go to FlightSafetyDetectives.com, the Flight Safety Detectives YouTube channel, or your favorite place to listen to podcasts. To contact John and Greg about the show, send them an email at FlightSafetyDetectives at gmail.com. And remember, for aviation insurance needs, contact Avemco Insurance at avemco.com or give them a call at 888 888- 879-0389. Mention Flight Safety Detectives and receive a 5% discount. Thanks for listening to the Flight Safety Detectives and remember to always fly safe. <laughs>